webinar at this time, and I would now like to introduce Hannah Stewart. Hannah Stewart is a licensed graduate social worker and will be the lead social worker for Morgan County Schools this year. She has a Master's of Social Work from the University of New England and a Bachelor's of Social Work from East Carolina University. She has previously worked as the expert facilitator at Morgan County Partnership, as a therapist with East Ridge Health Systems, and as a case manager and program coordinator with Starting Points Family Resource Center. Okay, Hannah, if you're ready to go, I will hand things over to you. West Virginia, and we're going to talk about our school-based expert. Um, so let's kind of jump in. Our learning objectives today, um, just taking knowledge of our expert process here in West Virginia schools um, and how we're using that in Morgan County to learn uh, about our barriers to implementation, how to avoid them, how to overcome them. These will be specific to our schools, but a lot of them could be generalized to other school systems and how you want to approach implementation. And um, we're just going to develop an appreciation of the data gathering process and analysis and how that um, helps us to continuously improve the process and the program. If you're not utilizing expert now, if you're not doing expert screenings or if you're unfamiliar with the expert process, I think that you'll be able to still follow along with what we're saying. I'm not necessarily talking about specifics of how expert is conducted, but more about the process itself and what our expert program does here in Morgan County, West Virginia. So the first thing is the Morgan County Partnership uh, is a nonprofit organization and also a substance abuse coalition um, for prevention efforts here in Morgan County, and they hold our substance abuse expert grant. And they were the first ones to write that grant in conjunction with the school system. And we started that in 2013, 2014. We'll talk a little bit more about them and um, kind of as we go on. But I just wanted you to know that this is uh, the lead agency for substance abuse expert grants. The second uh, agency is Morgan County Schools. We conduct our expert screens in Warm Springs Middle School at Berkeley Springs High School and in Pawpaw High School. Um, the school system, not last year, but the year before, um, the 15-16 school year, were able to write their own expert grant. So we actually have two expert grants in our county. One called at the Morgan County Partnership, and that one is for substance abuse um, specific. And then we have an expert grant that we use at the school system that's more mental health specific. So we're screening for depression, anxiety, trauma. Um, this year alone, across these three schools, we screened 874 students. And we have approximately 2,000 students to 2,500 students at any given time. So, um, and that's across ages K through 12. So just to give you a little bit of an idea about Morgan County, and why we went this direction. Um, if you don't understand Morgan County, you don't necessarily understand why this is so important for us. Morgan County, um, Berkeley Springs here, the star, that's where most of our schools are located, is right within the heart of Berkeley Springs. The county itself then has another school that's about 25 miles up the mountain on Kakapa Mountain, and that's called Pawpaw High School. Um, and then it also has Pawpaw elementary school. So it's actually a K through 12 all kind of connected and we do our screenings in those uh, specific locations. So these two schools, um, we're in a rural area, the, the nearest Walmart, the nearest Target, the nearest um, shopping center is about 40 minutes away from either one of those towns and they're about 40 minutes from each other, kind of like I said 25 miles from each other over the mountains. But so we're very rural. We have a lot of weekenders and retirees. As you can see, we're close to some uh, metropolitan areas. We're close to Pittsburgh. We're close to Baltimore. We're close to D.C. Uh, so we have a lot of weekenders and retirees that come in um, and enjoy our community. We have a lot of tourists that come in and enjoy our community. So the community itself, um, downtown, is focused primarily um, 
on catering a lot to those weekenders. And so the rest of our county then is rural. Um, and in that you have um, what you would see in a lot of Appalachia areas. Um, you have a lot of poverty, a lot of transportation issues, um, a lot of health issues, a lot of mental health issues. We have a lot of addiction issues. We're very close to what they're calling the heroin highway, which is Interstate 81 and Interstate 70 connecting out of Baltimore and down into Virginia, and that comes straight through our neighboring county. And so we have a lot of addiction and opiate issues, um, like everyone else across the country. I'm sure if you're um, working with addictions, you understand our intense uh, opiate addiction issues. So, so we're dealing with that as well. And then we have what I just call rural estates. Uh, we have a lot of families that have moved to Berkeley Springs because they're trying to get out of the more metropolitan areas. They're trying to make a better place for their families. And so they're moving from the city down into Berkeley Springs. And so we have kind of these two opposite ends of the spectrum that are working together. We have the weekenders, the retirees, uh, a lot of older folks, a lot of tourism. And that's kind of the picture when you look up Berkeley Springs that you see um, on a map. And then we have this kind of hidden underbelly that's um, a lot of poverty and a lot of families that are struggling with homelessness and transportation issues. So this gives you kind of an idea of where we are. So why Esper? We're a rural community, like I said, with very limited resources. Um, up until last, or about two years ago, uh, the community mental health center that's in our town only had one full-time therapist working here, and they had some other therapists that were there part-time. We have several um, private practitioners that have practices here in our community. Um, however, uh, again, up until about the last couple of years, there just wasn't, um, we just weren't able to get our family there due to transportation issues or due to um, insurance issues. So there was a lot of resource uh, issues for us. Um, there were very long wait lists to get to those people because we had such limited resources. Um, in our school system, up until the 2013-2014 year, we had one county school social worker, and he worked primarily on just crisis basis. He was going from school to school with whatever kid was triaged as being in the most need at that time, but we didn't have any real continuing services for those kids. So it was um, a brief intervention at the school, it was what can we do to get this kid stabilized at this moment, and then what can we do to help them after that. Um, and so because that's kind of the framework that we were doing, Esbert really worked well in that. Um, a brief intervention, we see the kid, and then we refer them out for other resources. Um, so it also assisted with some of those burdens that we were seeing due to our high rate of poverty. We have a 70% rate of poverty in our school system. So most of our families are below the poverty line. And there's a lot, like I said, a lack of transportation. There's a, sometimes there's a lot, lack of parent support. Parents don't understand mental health issues. They think the kid's just acting out. Parents um, are too concerned with whatever it is that they're dealing with, their loss of job, their addiction, their alcoholism, and so then they're not being supportive of their children. And again, the, just that financial piece. So our current expert program right now has two prongs. The substance abuse expert grant, which is held by the Morgan County Partnership, is getting ready to go into its fifth year. We refer students from our own brief interventions and brief treatment to groups and school-based programs within our community. Um, since the 2013-2014 school year, we've added um, two other mental health grants into our community. And we're trying to just continue to build services within the schools where our kids are at so that we can catch them um, and, and be able to assist them in a manner that's most effective for them. So we refer them to other school-based programs. We refer them to inpatient care. Um, it's based, our substance abuse, again, is based at our prevention and asset building nonprofit, the Morgan County Partnership. And so we work hand-in-hand -hand with a lot of their other prevention 
programs. In Morgan County, we work on a three-tiered model, which some of you may be familiar with and some of you aren't, but our education system works with the three-tier model of universal, which is things that we're doing for everybody, targeted students who are those that seem to be struggling and might need a little bit more help. So those are the ones that we use for like group work and then our selective, and those are our students that we use for individual. And so uh, partnering with local nonprofits and partnering with the school system to be able to provide services across all three tiers helps us not only to address prevention, but also to address intervention and treatment. The school system holds the mental health expert grant, and again, we're doing groups, school-based programs, um, we, we have a mental health team um, who our substance abuse facilitators are part of. So our mental health teams meet at each of the schools that we do expert in, and we try to meet once a month. Sometimes it's, that's not always possible. Sometimes it's every other month. And we just staff kids like you would at a staff meeting in a facility. We just, who's seeing this kid? What services are they receiving? What was their last craft score? What was their last PS2 score? Um, have they been rescreened? What what are they doing? What services can we give them? What services do we need to move them out of? Um, and that'll be in its third year this year in our school system. So our expert facilitators are providing screenings in the school, and they are providing brief interventions to students um, that are low, moderate, or high risk. They're also providing some brief treatment, again, because wait lists are so long, because transportation is an issue, and because parental support is a problem. Um, being able to do that brief treatment there at the school for those kids, um, and that a lot of times, once yeah. their parents sign that opt out, we don't um, have to speak with them again. Sorry here, friends. I'm not sure why that just went out. Um, okay, are we all... Together again, we're good. So being able to provide that brief treatment in the school system, uh, they provide us a room, we walk around the playground, walk around the track, whatever it is that we need to do based on the school. We're, at each time that we screen, um, when we do screening school-wide, um, we screen for both programs at the same time to limit the amount of time that we have to be in the classroom. And then we're also able to provide psychoeducation and brief interventions to the whole classroom at one time. This year, this past, or this past school year, we, again, screened 874 students. So our expert program is school-based, but it's community-minded. Um, this picture here is part of our youth coalition. Some of the numbers that we have from our surveys um, show that 85% of our students are not drinking underage. And that's a huge um, thing to think about because what we tend to focus on is that 15% of our students are drinking underage instead of changing that social norm. So we really are working towards changing our social norms in our community and helping our students to understand that most of their friends aren't doing this, so let's try not to do it. Um, so this is just our social norms campaign that our youth coalition against substance abuse came up with. And let's talk about how 85% of your peers don't drink. They have several of these. We put these up across the school. But this is, um, and across our county, and this is kind of how we work. Esper is not just something that's done with a screen um, and then a brief intervention and then maybe brief treatment and then a referral to treatment. Um, our expert coordinators really um, are, are working on prevention as well, and awareness and education, and they're out in our community helping our community to understand what the issues are that we're really trying to face. So we work with everyone, and referrals come from everywhere, and we refer everywhere. This is our chief of police, and this is us, uh, he and I at our zombie walk this year. So that's a fundraiser for the Morgan County Partnership. and. It was very cool that day, so you can see my, my headband and my gloves. It was about 50 degrees, 45 degrees, and we were out there for four or five hours. But he came out and he stood out there, and we're building relationships. And we stood out there and we talked to kids, and we talked to parents, and we talked to families. And so when you call a parent then and say, hey, you know what, I screamed your kid today, and there's something going on and we need to talk about it, then they're really a lot more apt to speak to you because 
you're not just um, an unknown name on the other end of the telephone line. You're a face that they remember and they saw when they were at the zombie walk or they were somewhere else. Um, our chief of police has made referrals to our programs um, for us to check on kids and see kids and screen kids. Our prosecuting attorney's office has uh, made referrals to us. Our, um, our county commission has. Our, one of our local groups that's working on recovery, like for drugs, um, they've made referrals to us. So by being out in the community and working with everyone on the things that they're doing, we're also finding that then we're getting referrals from them. And then we're able to refer for services to them as well. Um, outreach, just again, outreach. This is um, several of the outreach events that we did this year. This is our recovery event in the park. This is our back to school bash. This is our prom, our after prom party to prevent underage drinking. And so with that, we're able to provide some brief interventions, some psychoeducation to students that are coming in about uh, substance abuse, about substance abuse prevention. We're interacting with those parents and students. We're helping the community be comfortable with the conversation. We're helping the community to understand what the conversation is that ESPERT is doing. Why are we screening kids? Why are we doing brief interventions? Why are there social workers in our schools doing treatment? It's because it's important and it's because it keeps our kids from being just a lit candle at a recovery event to being somebody that's there and working towards prevention efforts instead. So we do these outreach events, again, just to make the community more comfortable with us and to bring them in on the conversation. The more people that are talking about ESPER, the more people that are talking about prevention, the more people that are talking about substance use, the more people we're able to reach. So one of the things that our ESPER program focuses on is in our brief treatment is coping skills. And we do this through group work, we do this through presentation, and we do this through um, individual treatment. But we're really just developing workshops and groups um, that are both psychoeducation and brief treatment to develop new skills. Um, in our community, a lot of our students we find just don't know another way to deal with something. So I find a lot of kids that are smoking marijuana or that are drinking or that are using tobacco have always watched their mom, their dad, their brother, their aunt, their grandma um, smoke or um, chew or drink. And when their parents and their guardians and their adult role models are stressed out, what do they do? They grab a bottle. What do they do? They grab a joint. And so it's helping our students to understand that there are other ways for us to be able to cope with life stressors. We don't want our substance use to become the solution to a problem because then the problem just gets bigger and the solution then becomes the problem. And so that's really what we focus on when we're trying to develop coping skills, when we're doing groups and when we're doing workshops with students. Psychoeducation, brief treatment to just understand that substance abuse might seem like a solution to a problem, but it just becomes a bigger problem. So prevention, we, if they haven't started, as we said, 85% of our teens um, in our community aren't drinking underage, and that's fantastic, and we don't want them to start. So we partner with other agencies. Here I am, um, this is Rose Jackson from Shenandoah Women's Center, which is our local domestic violence and sexual assault agency uh, for assistance and prevention for women. And then this is um, our, our town of Bath administrator, um, police administrator. Um, so she's an, a great presenter, and the three of us present a lot on prevention, um, on safety, um, if you're going to drink, if you're going to be curious, if you're going to use, are you doing it smarter? We don't want you to. These are the consequences. But at the same time, if you're going to do it, we don't want you to get hurt. And so this is um, just presentations that we do across the school just in prevention efforts. The other thing that our ESPERT program um, is trying to do is awareness and education for community members and for parents to utilize uh, motivational interviewing and utilize some of the ESPERT concepts um, in their interaction with youth. So um, this is myself and 
my former boss, Gary McDaniel, who's uh, worked with Morgan County Schools for a, a lot of years. And we're teaching parents and teaching our community members how to utilize motivational interviewers to ask the hard questions, to get to, to kids and say, you know, are you using, why are you using, what is good about it, what is bad about it, what can you do um, instead of using, and do I need to get you help? And so those are the things that we're trying to get our community members, our parents, our teachers to be able to ask. Because if they can ask a kid those questions and then refer them to us or refer them to the school counselor, we have a lot more information to start with and can understand where a student is coming from. It also gives them the opportunity to work on prevention in their own homes and to help our students at home. Because sometimes kids don't want to talk to a social worker at school, but they might talk to their favorite teacher or they might talk to the volunteer that comes into their classroom. Um, and so if everybody is able to ask those questions, if everybody is willing to say what's good about it, what's bad about it, you know, do you need help, um, we're more likely to reach more kids and we're more impactful in the work that we're doing. So this is a little bit um, just kind of a snapshot of our program. In 2012, um, these were our numbers, illicit drug use, cigarettes, marijuana, alcohol, um, they were all right there around or above the national average. And in 2016, you can see that our numbers have dropped. Um, they're by no means at zero. There are still kids that are doing it. And I'm so sure that, you know, there could be some uh, falsification of answering questions. But what we're showing is that our numbers are going down. And I don't think that that's just because of SPER, but I do think that it's because our SPER model works within our prevention, intervention, and treatment model really well to reach kids at every level so that kids not only are getting the help that they need when they have a problem, but that they're getting the help that they need to prevent themselves from getting into a problem. So I think the Morgan County is doing a really great job of trying to um, drop our underage substance abuse numbers. So before I move kind of on to barriers, are there any questions up to this point? Hey, Hannah. Um, this is Jess. So we have had a couple things that came in. Um, okay. The first one is, given the challenges of the parents and caregivers <laughs> are experiencing, how does this ESPER project work to engage them in the process? So we will probably touch on that um, just a little bit more coming up. But one of the things that we do is we, we work with our local nonprofit, um, the Morgan County Partnership. We work with a nonprofit called Starting Point. We work with our school systems. We work with um, the Boys and Girls Club. We work with um, 4-H and Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and all of the um, after-school programs. and. And so we look at those and um, try to get things to parents where the parents are at. So if the parents have to come pick up their kid from the after-school program, what can we do right then and there to be able to engage a parent? Can we give them a flyer? Can we ask them to save for 10 minutes? Um, another thing that we're doing is uh, we're, we're actually getting ready to start something new. Um, up until this point, um, for the last probably seven years, we've done something called Parent Child Academy, which is a program where we had parents and children come. We had door prizes, we had food, and we did something like everybody separately, and then we came back and we did something together. Um, our numbers for that had kind of dropped off over the years. So we're getting ready to, for this school year, start something utilizing our positive action curriculum. And we're going to do videos that we're going to post on YouTube and Facebook. And um, we're going to put on the school's website and on our local nonprofit website that are just little pointers and videos um, aimed at helping our parents to understand their own coping skills, how to build coping skills, and giving them a resource where they can engage with somebody, even if it's just through a Facebook comment. So we're trying to reach out in different areas because we have had some difficulty in probably the last year or two 
with our parents just kind of dropping out. The other issue is that our guardians are always changing, it seems like. So parents and um, uh, are being incarcerated. They're uh, leaving their kids with other caretakers. So for us, sometimes it's an issue of trying to figure out who the appropriate caretaker is. So mom might be listed as the child's um, parent and as their guardian, but they're actually living with an aunt. So sometimes it takes us some time to engage that person. Um, but usually if the child's living with somebody else, a lot of times we have a better chance of engaging them than we had a chance of engaging the parent because they're already invested in making sure that that child succeeds or they wouldn't have helped um, or been willing to remove them from the situation that was so difficult for them. Um, other ways that we engage with parents is we do a lot of give giveaways. Um, if we need parents to come in for something, we do that. Um, it, I think that our biggest challenge with parents a lot of times too is um, that they're afraid if their kid is talking about their issues with substance use that they're going to tell them the parents' issues with substance abuse. And so it's an awareness and an education thing that we let parents know that that information does not go into the child's school records that we are not there just to contact the police unless we find a safety concern and making sure that they understand the full extent of confidentiality. Does that answer the question? I think so. I think you gave um, quite a few examples. Um, so we do have a couple more. Did you want to take them now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So um, the next one is, do you have peer advocate groups, including peer leaders? So, sort of. We don't have anything that we call a peer advocate group. Um, we do have some peer leaders, and we do encourage kids um, to be leaders. So one of the things that the Morgan County Partnership does in conjunction with a lot of our other nonprofits in the school system is our Youth Leadership Academy. And every year um, since we've, we started it with year one, and then the next year we added a year two for those kids who have been there for the first year, and then do a year one. So we do... Um, two years of a Youth Leadership Academy where students go in and they learn skills that help you to become a leader and how to reach out to other students. So that's one of the ways that we try and encourage peer leaders. We have a bullying prevention club, um, and those are peer leaders. They're out there and they are trying to make sure that students are, are using their um, – their influence for the good. Um, we have our youth coalition, and our youth coalition is working on changing the social norms. They are working towards um, making, there's the ones I did the poster at the beginning that says, let's talk about how 85% of your peers don't drink. And so they're out there saying like, hey, we don't drink, we don't want you to drink. If you are, let's talk about how we can get you some help. And we have something called Teen Court. So for kids that have um, been written a citation for a status offense, um, the prosecution, the sheriff's department, the school system, um, the probation officers have the option of referring those students to Teen Court, where they go on trial with a peer defendant, um, defense attorney. They have a peer prosecuting attorney. They have a jury of their peers. Um, and that way, it's not adults saying this is a bad thing. It's their peers that are telling them, hey, this is what we think about what you did, but we're going to give you this much community service, or this is what we think that you need to do um, as a consequence for that. And then that student is supposed to go on, and they have to serve so many hours on teen court. So. They might get trained as a lawyer and be a defense attorney in the next trial, or they might just sit on the jury. Um, so we take those kids that were in trouble and that a lot of people would see as being um, a, not a leader or not somebody that we want kids to follow, and we engage them in a process that makes them a leader and makes them a positive influence. All right. What's the next Thank question? You. 
the next one is, um, so now we're going to switch gears and talk about the screening. Um, so okay. they asked, what screening tools do you use? Um, and how are they being screened? Are they filling out questionnaires or being interviewed in person? Um, and how honest do you think these students are being? So for screening tools, our initial screening tools are the CRAF for substance abuse and the PSQ for mental health. And the PSQ um, focuses on depression, anxiety, and trauma. So we screen everyone initially in the classroom. We go into classrooms, we work with teachers to set up a time, we hand out the screens, and we give them time to fill it out, and then at the end we provide some psychoeducation and some brief intervention. Um, and I think that a lot of students are um, fairly truthful. For one, we really stress confidentiality. We stress the fact that this is not a program where we're trying to knock them out, that we're not trying to, this isn't a gotcha program. This isn't us trying to pick out who we think are the bad seeds. This is really just a time for us to have a conversation and see if there's anything that we can do to support them. Um, we also um, then after the screens have been completed and we've scored all the screens and we've gone through all of them and we've developed kind of our matrix for how we need to um, see who needs to hit first, who's at high risk, who's at low risk, then we rescreen them again. That usually takes from the time we screen them to the time we start seeing kids is about two months. So when we go then to go back and start seeing those kids, we rescreen them one-on-one, -on -one. and depending on who's doing it, depends on how they do it, um, or whether they just do an interview, whether they ask the kids to just refill out the paper um, screen, and um, a lot of that depends on the kid, too. You know, you might, um, when you're talking to a high schooler, have them just refill out the paper screen because they understand the questions fully, but when you're talking to a middle schooler, you might um, just do it through an interview process so that you can better or so that you can make sure that they better understand the questions. Um, so then there's that re-screening process with the one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so again, I think that probably most of the time they're very truthful. We have found, though, um, at our more rural high schools in Pawpaw, our numbers are fairly low, but they are also self-reporting to our social worker or we're seeing things on social media that um, it's kind of contrary to that, those numbers. And so, but because it's a small community, um, if the expert person comes over there and pulls you to talk to you, then everybody is, you know, going to know. So we're trying to figure out a way to um, be able to reach those kids without them feeling like if they answer truthfully that they're going to be singled out. All right. Sounds good. Um, the last one we have um, for this portion is, are you guys required to get parental consent before the students under 18 can participate in activities? So what we do is, and we're going to talk about this. Um, let me talk about that in a minute because we're going to go over that when we go into barriers. Um, I think that I think it'll be better understood if we just work through that question when we talk about barriers because. Um, consent is, is huge, but yes, the short answer is yes, we have to have some sort of consent. And All we right. go through what we call passive consent. All right? All right, sounds good. So that was it for now. So we, the floor is yours again. <laughs> All right, guys. So um, barriers, parent knowledge, um, a lot, and parent literacy, a lot of our parents um, don't have more than a fifth grade reading level. So when a letter came home asking for consent to screen their child or explaining the escort program, they didn't understand what it was talking about. So one of the things that came up after we sent the initial letter home explaining the escort program and that we were going to be providing screens universally to sixth through twelfth graders is that there was a lot of fear that we were doing urine tests or hair tests and were actually drug screening kids instead of just doing a survey. So we had to send out a second letter, and we had to make sure that um, your ability to read that was 
was on a lower literacy level, so we dropped that down to about a fifth grade reading level. So we, we don't send a letter home to parents that's above a fifth grade reading level. Um, so that was one of the issues. And then we also did a huge article in our local newspaper about the escort program and about what it means and what screening is and that that's a survey and it's a piece of paper that our kids are filling out and that we're not actually doing drug testing. Um, we let parents know through, like I said, a letter that goes home, and there was some talk about whether or not to do active consent, whether to do passive consent, whether we just um, go ahead and just give out all the screens to students, you know, what is it that we were going to do? And what we, what we was agreed upon was that it would be a, what we call passive consent. So a letter goes home to all of those students at Warm Springs Middle School, Berkeley Springs High School, and Pawpaw Schools at the beginning of the school year. And if parents do not want their child to participate, then they sign the letter and send it back. So we get very few letters that are actually signed back. And what we do find is that the letters that come back, a lot of times are from our very, very um, conservative parents, parents who um, have deep, um, spiritual or religious beliefs, or they're from parents that when we look at it and we, we can see their name in the police blog, and we know that they've been arrested before for substance use. And so we get kind of the um, extremes of people who don't even want their kids to know about substance use, and um, parents whose kids know probably way too much about substance use, and so they don't want them screened. So we, that is a barrier that we continue to try and figure out how can we get those kids that really need screens to be screened and how do we provide education about substance use, substance dependence, substance abuse, um, what's the difference between curiosity and what's the difference between something that's becoming a problem um, to kids who are, have never been exposed to it or to kids who have been exposed way too much to it. And so those opposite ends of the spectrum is something that we're continuously trying to figure out. Um, the other thing is um, understanding confidentiality. So we had to really stress, and we stressed this to students, we stressed this to teachers, we stressed this to counselors, we stressed this to parents, that when we do these screens, that this is not something that is shared with everybody. Yes, our mental health team um, shares basic information um, that is necessary for the student to be successful in school, but not about what their actual screen says. You know, did they say that they do it, um, they've driven a car before while drunk. Um, we don't share that kind of information even in our mental health team meetings. This information is not in their school records. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times parents and counselors will be like, well, can you tell me what happened? I, you know, I gave you a referral on this kid. Can you you know, and, and we just have to remind them that this is separate. This is not a school-based program. The, our, our HIPAA um, <clears throat> keeps us from being able to share information that maybe FERPA, which is the school system confidentiality code, uh, would let us uh, share. So we have to be very careful that while working in the school system, we fall under both of those laws of confidentiality, but that we ultimately have to do what's best to keep the students' information safe. Uh, it was also important for us to help parents and students understand that when we're sending our state reports, because we are grant funded, we have to send state reports, but when we're sending those state reports, we're sending aggregate data. We're not saying that um, Susie, somebody, said that they drank while alone, um, that we're just sending, saying that we screened a 16-year-old girl and that she's at Berkeley Springs High School. So understanding what the limits of confidentiality are, what kind of information we're sharing. Um, a barrier was getting some classroom time. Um, as the years have gone by, it's, it's gotten easier for us to, to get that classroom time. But in the beginning, it was hard. You know, teachers have um, standards that they have to meet, and they have to get ready for testing. And there's all kinds of other things that go on in their classroom. So it's finding the teachers who are willing to give you the time so that you can screen is really important. Or teachers that are willing to give you the time so that, yeah, you can pull students during my class and I'm not going to throw a fit about it. So that was a barrier for us. And 
And lastly, really, it was just understanding of what the escort program looks like in the school. This is not a program where, you know, a kid is acting out and so you just call us and we pull them and we call them down and we send them back to class. There's a process and there are procedures and there are very specific things that we do as part of the escort process when we're in the school system. So it was helping them to understand which kids could be referred to our program, what our role was there, and how to um, get them to utilize that role and to utilize the program for what it was used for. And I think that at this point, we've done a really great job with our counselors and our teachers and our principals of understanding how the program works and, and the effectiveness of it um, and, and what the model looks like. But it took a lot of communication um, on both the partnerships part and the school system uh, social workers part uh, to get that through. Teacher support is, is really um, the number one thing for implementation. You need their classroom for screening. Um, and over the years, we've started doing both screens at the same time instead of doing them at two separate times, and that's been very helpful. And that way, we're, we're taking minimal classroom time. Um, but teacher support is really just our number one way that we can get implementation. But uh, counselors and principals as well, but really those teachers allowing us into the classroom to do those initial screenings is the most important part of being able to implement that. So finding a teacher that understands, that's willing to support the model, and that thinks that this program is something that is useful and helpful to their students, um, that's going to be the most important part to implementing the program. Uh, so, you know, we do screening. We do our brief interventions. We do our brief treatment. Brief treatment, again, is um, we're doing that individualized or in small group settings. Um, and when we get to the referral to treatment part, um, then we have to figure out where does the family stand on this? Is the family able to provide resources? Is the family able to um, take the child somewhere, if the child has to go to the emergency room because they're suicidal or they need to go into inpatient detox, is that parent able to get that child there? And so um, we have to know what our resources are. We have local community mental health centers. We have one that's about 40 minutes away, and then we have one that has an office here in town, and then they have an office that's 40 minutes away as well. But um, can we get them into our local community health centers? One of the great things is that last year we were granted something called an expanded school mental health grant, and we partnered with our local community health center, Eastridge Health System, to be able to provide some school-based therapy and to provide Tier 1 and Tier 2 um, treatment as well. So we're doing individual therapy under that grant with both Eastridge um, Health Systems and our expanded school mental health facilitator. But then we're also doing Tier 2 groups in psychoeducation, and we're doing Tier 1 universal things. So our local community health center has become a big part of us being able to reach students that otherwise wouldn't have been able to get services because they're, being able, they're going to do that school-based health. Um, our private providers have always worked really well with us. They are friendly, and they are willing to work somebody in that really needs it. And they've always worked really well in communication. Um, we do other school-based services that a lot of times we refer students to. So somebody might be low, we might do a brief intervention, but we feel like they just need some extra support. So we might refer them to clubs or groups that are working in their school. We might refer them to um, <coughs> talk to their positive action person, and positive action is an evidence-based curriculum that we use tier one across um, the school system K through 12. So it might be that we refer them to their positive actions person. It might be that we talk with the positive actions person about just engaging that student in their group. Um, we utilize interns. We're fairly close to WVU. They have a um, satellite program for their master's of social work program here in Martinsburg, West Virginia, which is about 35, 40 minutes from us. And we are this year for the first time getting a BSW intern from Shepherd University, which is about an hour from us. Um, but she's a, a local um, student. She was born and raised in Morgan County and went to Shepherd. So she's going to be working with us this year as an intern. Um, we've also um, been talking with 
Marshall University and now getting master's level interns or bachelor's level interns here. So we utilize interns to fill in some of the gaps. Um, and depending on whether they're a bachelor's level or master's level, it depends on what tier they can do. But we use them to fill in the gaps. So somebody maybe needs um, not intensive outpatient treatment, but they do need some treatment and they do need someone to talk to. An intern is a great way for us to be able to get them some assistance and yet be able to accommodate their schedule and accommodate their parents' finances or lack of transportation. Um, so when you're utilizing your resources, it's really um, about utilizing what you have, building relationships with the community um, organizations that are around you, and figuring out how to bridge the gaps for what you don't have. How can you um, put something into place? How can you build something? How can you work something through to get our kids the resources that we need? Because we do have such limited resources in this area. All right, so my question to you is, at this point, what barriers to the implementation of universal screening would you expect to encounter in your school system? If any of you are working in the school system, what would you see as um, a barrier for that? Anybody? Looks like we're getting a couple in. Um, okay. It says we have uh, staff to conduct the brief intervention would be a barrier. Um, time and school policies and concerns. Um, okay concern, time in the classroom, um, parental okay. consent. So, right. So parental consent, staff, and I'm sorry, what, what was the other thing you said? Um, so time in the classroom. Time in the classroom. Have, yeah, having staff to actually do the, do the um, intervention, mm -hmm. brief interventions, um, finding the time. Uh, okay. School, yeah, school policies and concern, school policy or school board approval, that one came up a couple times too. Okay. So, so let's just start going down through this. So having that parental consent, again, we talked about some of the barriers that we had. It's, it's making sure the parents understand that we're not here to narc them out. Um, that's a term that I use a lot because it's something that our parents um, understand. We're not here to rat them out. We are not here to get them into trouble. Um, we, a lot of times we say we're a different kind of social worker um, because in a rural community like this, anytime someone says social worker, they automatically um, connect us to Child Protective Services and someone coming in to take their kids. And so we, we are constantly trying to um, revamp our community's idea of what a social worker is and what we do. So uh, before you would start to implement, I would recommend that you do a newspaper article, that you send a letter home with students um, through the schools about what a social worker is or what an addictions counselor is or what the program is for and what it's not for. Sometimes we just say this is what we're going to do and this is why we're going to do it, but we don't fill in the gaps in the questions of what is it not for? What are we not doing? We are not trying to get you in trouble. We are not looking to call CPS on everyone. We are not, um, we don't think that you're a bad parent. Um, if your child has um, been experimenting and it's gone from experimentation to dependence. Um, having the staff to do it, I think that we were really lucky in being able to, we have two grants. Uh, that we receive from our state Department of Health and Human Resources behavioral health facilities um, at the state level. And so we have two grants that cover most of our costs for that. Um, so that was how we were able to get staffing. However, you can hire a social worker in a Title I school 
um, through ESSA, you can use Title I funds to um, hire a social worker. So just hiring a social worker within a school system and then training them on how to use ESPER is a great idea. Um, the other thing is can you partner with a local community health, um, mental health agency or a local community health center or your local health department to go into the schools and find some time that you guys can do that together. Um, as far as time in the classroom, yeah, that it, it, it really is a great big barrier. Um, we try to keep it as simple and as streamlined as possible. We give them those dates we, before school even starts, <coughs> Before school even starts, we've talked to the principals and we talked to teachers and we've gotten those dates set up so that they know ahead of time that on those days we're coming in and what we're going to be doing and how much time that we're going to need. And we try to keep our screening time anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes when we're in the classroom. We don't want to take up too much classroom time. Um, and as far as your school policies and your school board, that's really the place that you need to start. We were really lucky here that our superintendent um, understand the importance of mental health and on how mental health and substance abuse affect a child's learning. And when you come at it from that direction, when you're talking with your superintendent, when you're talking with your board of ed, when you're talking with your administrators, when you come at it from the direction of understanding that mental health and substance abuse um, affect how a child learns, they affect their test scores, they affect their classroom behavior, they affect our teachers' ability to, to manage their behavior in the classroom, and when we help them understand that this program is something that's going to help them and their test scores and their classroom management, then you're more likely to help them jump on board. And our superintendent was really helpful in us being able to do that. The other thing is that our nonprofit already had a foot in the doors. We were already doing too good for drugs. We were already doing positive actions. Um, we were doing wellness fairs. and. And so the Morgan County Partnership was in the school doing things to help the school and to promote positive interactions with students and to promote positive behavior changes. And so because we already had our foot in the door, we were able to um, connect with teachers and administrators and counselors that we were already um, closely connected with and help kind of spread the word through the rest of them. Are there any other questions or any other thoughts? It, it's definitely um, it's definitely a big undertaking to get something like this started, especially if there isn't anything like it in your school system. But it's definitely worthwhile um, to get together a group that's willing to work on that together. There was something that came in like intermittently, but um, someone asked that is the screening and results shared with the primary care physician of a student if they have them? Um, we, are o we only share that after a parent would have signed a release of information. So once the parent signs or um, allows the child to be screened, we only contact the parent if there's an issue. Um, so a lot of times they're not shared with the primary caregiver unless there's a problem. Um, we take very seriously the fact that these are brief interventions, um, brief treatment in the school system, and that we're here to support the student, not to nurse them out for their behavior again to their parents and to other adults in their life. Unless we see that it's affecting their functioning, if we feel that they're in danger, or we feel that it's become a serious issue, that this is this is moved from curiosity um, past abuse to um, all-out dependence. Um, so it, it kind of depends on where that child is on the spectrum of their usage. So just quickly to go over data, um, when we're trying to collect the data for this, you need to know what is it that you want to know? Um, what are the things that you want to know? And how that guides how you collect your data. Uh, we are under grant funding, so we have to collect the aggregate data for our state grants, the same as hospitals or mental health facilities that are utilizing the expert grants as well. What is your target goal? for the program, what is it that you want to accomplish in the end, and then how can you break that down to collect the data to show that you're moving towards that goal. Um, 
one of the things that we found is that we need better data collection systems, and this is still something that we're working on. Um, we're collecting aggregate data, but we, and we've started collecting like how many brief interventions we do, but we're not collecting some specific data to answer some of our target questions like how many girls do we have with a substance abuse issue? How many boys are we having? Uh, what is their number one substance that we're seeing? Because a lot of times it's just these are the kids that we're seeing and this is um, how many brief interventions and brief treatment. And if we go back and we really start to think about it, we can pick out, oh, that was a boy and it was, they were using alcohol and that was a girl and they were using uh, marijuana, and, and we can think about it, but we're not collecting it in a way that's helpful for us when we're looking at trends. Um, when you're looking at data, it's, it's really helpful to use what you know. Find a tool that's helpful for you. Is Excel something that you're familiar with? Is Access something? Is Google Docs? Does your agency or organization have a way to collect that data for you that you don't have to recreate it? Um, so using what you know, if your data collection tool is user-friendly, you're more apt to use it and you're more apt to collect better data. Understanding that you have to have measurable goals. Qualitative and quantitative, though, are both really helpful in this kind of work. Do you have student stories that you can share about why your program is important and why it's impactful? Because those are the things that help when you're talking to the community. But do you have number of screens? Do you have the demographics? Do you have how many hours you spend. Those are the things that are really helpful when we're looking at writing grants and when we're talking to, say, our board members. Um, we collect data on our surveys. Um, we do two surveys every other year. We do the asset survey and we do the pride survey. And then we use our screens, our PSQ, the assist, the craft, um, and, and then there are satisfaction surveys you can use. These are our two big surveys. The 40 developmental asset, survey is one that the Morgan County Partnership does to measure internal and external assets. These are things that kids need to be successful. And we survey kids in fourth, sixth, eighth, and tenth grade every other year. Our prize survey is we use our substance abuse, alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs survey. Um, and we're measuring things like past 30-day use, annual perception of use, um, annual use. Um, and that's going through grades 6 through 12. We, um, at this point, don't have a large data collection tool for our mental health um, substance abuse grant or our mental health expert grant, and that's something that we're looking at trying to figure out. And as we're going through that we are um, just continuously um, trying to improve our data collection. Um, data collection is all about continuing improvement. It's all about you get to the end of the year and you see what you've collected and what is it that you missed and you still need and what didn't you need and what could have worked better. Um, when we're looking at continuing an improvement, we're also looking at what are our current trends for usage and what do we need to do to change our, um, our data collection to make sure that we're, um, we're catching that. Um, how do we follow students? We need to make sure that we're following students in a productive manner. Um, we're looking at are we following kids with dual diagnosis? Is the mental health expert or the school system or our substance abuse expert following the same kid who might have a dual diagnosis? Um, and it's really about a team approach because without the team working together, without our school counselors, our administrators, our experts, our expanded school mental health facilitators, without all of us sitting down at the table and saying, this is what this kid needs, this is where they're struggling, um, without all of that collateral data from everybody, this doesn't work in a school system setting. So we are about out of time, but I'm going to open it back up to what are some other questions that you might be having. 